Give thanks to him and praise his name, for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. That's Psalm 100. Our Lord has called us to worship and now he greets us. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of this earth. Amen. seated. God reconciles himself to us. We do not stop enough to listen to the still speaking God. And like the people of Jerusalem long ago, we often misunderstand the Spirit's movement among us. In the silence and stillness of this moment, let us draw near to God and listen.
Let us confess this together. We confess to you, renewing spirit, that we confuse unity with uniformity and diversity with divisiveness. We speak and behave as if being a part of your family means assimilating others to our way of living. We deny and destroy the beauty you created in each person. We long to change these patterns, O Creator, but we do not know how. Teach us to value challenge. Help us to see strength and difference and empower us to build your kingdom in creativity and love. Amen. Hear the good news. God's spirit has been poured out on all flesh and we have been made one. We are no longer scattered or divided, but gathered together to build up the kingdom on this earth. Thanks be to God. Let's confess of our faith together in the singing of I am, I am not my own.
fruit of the Spirit is called gentleness. Now, when you think of gentleness, it means you're doing things free from harshness or free from roughness. You're just doing it in a very nice way. So when you think of gentleness, maybe think of, let's look at a newborn baby holding a newborn baby. You're not going to just rip the baby out of their hand and shake it and move it around. No, no. It's a very fragile baby. It needs a lot of support. You need to hold it gently and hold its head and, you know, you hold it very nicely. Or let's say you're going into a hospital where there's a lot of ill people or unwell people. You're not going to go running there jumping up and down and shouting, I'm here, I'm here, everybody, I'm here. No, we go in there and we be quiet because those people need gentleness. Now, so gentleness means you do it calmly, quietly, no roughness. But that doesn't mean that if something bad is happening to you that you don't stand up for yourself. It just means that you don't sit there screaming and yelling or hitting or whatever. That you just say, okay, you deal with it in a gentle manner, just like Jesus would. For today's fruit, we're going to be looking at not bananas, we're going to be looking at Mr. Mellow Melon. So gentleness can be just kind of a, uh, just calm, gentle, mellow. I'm mellowed out because I couldn't come up with another fruit that started with G because we already did grapes. I was going to do grapefruit, but I didn't want to do that one. So we're going to talk about Mr. Mellow Melon. Oh boy. Mr. Mellow Melon. Pretty big. It's going to make a mess. So, whoa. Mr. Mellow Melon, what do we know about a melon? Well, I can tell you, just like I dropped this peach, it didn't splatter or anything, but if I was to pick this up and drop it, it would likely break. So you have to be gentle with a melon. You can't just throw it around and roll around. I mean, you can, but you might break it. But I just think of a mellow melon, and it reminds me of gentleness when, when you cut it, and you enjoy it and it's just soothing and it's just always such a gentle time in your lives when you're eating it most times we have it in summer and we're just by the pool we're lounging around and and we're just enjoying the quiet calm gentle life so that is why today's fruit is a melon just sit back be gentle with each other i'm going to read to you from Philippians 4, verse 5. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. We are called to be gentle people. And when we show our gentleness, others can be seeing that and they appreciate that and they'll, you're more approachable, you're more loving, and um, you're not anxious, you're just calm. So, be like Mr. Mellow Melon, just relax, calm down, be gentle. Let us close in prayer. Dear God, you are a great God and we are so thankful that you are a gentle God. May you help us to be gentle in our answers, gentle in our reactions to people, and gentle in the way we talk. We help us to let our gentleness be evident to all. You are a great God. We thank you for all you've done. In your name alone we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, before we go to our God in a time of intercessory prayer, just a couple of updates. For those who haven't heard, Ryan Wesselson went into hospital last week, started off with some headaches, not feeling well, some seizures, and um, he was admitted into Woodstock, has been since moved to London uh, University Hospital, and an induced coma because he's still experiencing some seizures, so that's our hope and prayer is that that's a good place for him to be right now while doctors and medical staff discern what's going on in Ryan's body. But obviously it's a very stressful time for, for the family and for all of us as we, we wait and wonder uh, what's, what's next, but we are confident that our Lord is merciful and, and uh, yeah, we'll respond to our prayers to restore Ryan to his wife and his family. Just give you an update that I received from Erica this morning. 
So I called and had a good night. They did take him slowly off sedation this morning, but they said he was still having seizures. So they put him under the full sedation again. They did say his blood pressure and oxygen were good, though when he was seizing. They will be taking him again for an MRI today. I did ask that if they do a full, that they do, will do a full body scan. There was talk of that. So we certainly pray for wisdom and discernment uh, for medical staff and also just comfort for the family, especially Erica and, uh, at this time as, she, as we all wait for Ryan to recover. Also, we've been blessed in our church family with a number of babies born, and I'm not sure when and w- when uh, they all got announced, so I'm just going to announce all of them. So we had... Uh, Cameron, David Van Andel, born to Ricky and David. Praise God for little Cameron. Ellie Grace Vanderspeck, born to Michelle and Derek. And to Franklin Bruce Tilstra, born to Alex and Ben. So we're certainly being tremendously blessed with uh, young children in our family, and we give God thanks and praise for, for that wonderful miracle of new life. Also, Art and, and Rennie Hedinga had a, uh, an amazing milestone wedding anniversary, a 65th, I think it was last week, or shortly, or some time ago, but we're so thankful that uh, we can celebrate or remember that milestone with them, 65 years of uh, God's faithfulness and their faithfulness to each other. Let's go to our God in prayer. <clears throat> O oh Lord, our God, our ever-present help in trouble. We come before you once again seeking your help. We need your presence and comfort, O oh God, as news of natural disasters reaches us from around the world. Wildfires in Israel now under control, but burned more than 4,200 acres. A water shortage on the Colorado River impacting around 40 million people in the U.S. and Mexico. Fatal flooding in Ethiopia's capital, and now we hear of possible flooding in New York City with another hurricane. Wildfires in France that consumed over 14,000 acres and injured dozens. And of course, our heart continues to break with this 7.2 magnitude earthquake in Haiti, which has claimed nearly 2,000 lives so far. And with this tropical storm and grace, it's hampering efforts to reach survivors. Oh Lord, have mercy. We desperately need your healing, loving God, as the world continues to battle COVID-19 and its effects. We long for your peace that passes all understanding, faithful God. As we anxiously watch the news from Afghanistan, as countries take in refugees fleeing the country after Taliban militants took over, and as other countries build walls. Lord, have mercy. And closer to home, Lord God, we are on bended knee praying for a son of our church family, Ryan, who continues to battle this strange illness resulting in this need to induce coma. Lord, it is our prayer that this will be a time of rest and recovery for Ryan as doctors are given wisdom by you to discern what is going on and how best to treat it. Oh Lord, please restore this child to his wife and to his family and to us, his church family. Hear our prayers, O oh Lord, and please have mercy. Yet even as overwhelming as all of our, our trials can be, we do still see signs of hope and life. We see it in the birth of Cameron. We see it in the birth of Ellie Grace and Franklin Bruce. 
Lord, thank you for these gifts of life. Lord, we look forward to walking alongside these families and helping them to raise up their children to know and to love you. Lord, we see your faithfulness in a 65th wedding anniversary milestone of Art and Rennie. What a beautiful testimony of your love and their love, your faithfulness and their faithfulness to each other. We celebrate all of the milestones that you allow us to enjoy. Faith, hope, and love are all around us. Remind us, redeeming God, of your care for all people. Open our eyes, our hearts, and our minds, we pray. Transform us that we might share your love with this great big world. Fill us with your spirit, we pray. In Jesus' precious name, and all God's children say, Amen. Today's Bible reading will be from Revelation 7, 9 to 17. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, praise and glory, and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders asked me, these in white robes, who are they? And where did they come from? I answered, Sir, you know. And he said, These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is the word of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, today we often think of painting as the central medium of Western art history. But for much of the medieval and early modern period, tapestries were the most valued form of artistic expression. A tapestry is a large piece of cloth with a pattern or picture that is created by sewing or weaving different colored threads onto a special type of strong cloth. In short, it is something that is unified and beautiful that is made up of many different parts. There is a beauty of unity in diversity. On the screen, you see the picture of the tapestry of the apocalypse in Angers, France, which depicts scenes out of the book of Revelation. The scene that we are spending a little time on today is the scene that comes out of Revelation chapter 7, one of the most beautiful scenes in all of Scripture. A very needed scene since this part of the apocalyptic tapestry 
comes after some pretty dark and scary scenes in Revelation chapter 6. Those reading or hearing Revelation 7 for the first time might, in fact, John expect John to fill it in with even more grim news. After all, Revelation 8 at least partly returns to vivid, vivid descriptions of suffering and misery. Yet Revelation 7 actually contains what Barbara Rossing calls a salvation interlude, an intermission, a rest, if you will. Now, if we remember our Revelation imagery, this rest occurs at the very razor's edge between the opening of the sixth seal and the seventh seal. In John's vision, the seven seals hold closed a scroll in heaven, and as each seal is broken, a new judgment is unleashed on the earth. Listen as John describes the opening of the sixth seal at the end of Revelation chapter 6. I watched, and as he opened the sixth seal, there was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. The whole moon turned blood red. And the stars in the sky fell to the earth as figs drop from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The heavens receded like a scroll being rolled up and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and everyone else, both slave and free, hid in caves and among the rocks in the mountains. They called on the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can withstand it? After the sixth seal is broken, we would anticipate that the next event will be the breaking of the seventh seal and that the end will come. The pattern has run its expected cycle through the messianic woes to the dissolution of the cosmos. All that can follow now with the seventh seal is the appearance of God himself and the eschatological events, bodily resurrection and judgment. Salvation in the heavenly world for the redeemed and damnation for the unfaithful. But John, through the Holy Spirit, is more creative with his interpretation of apocalyptic traditions. Instead of the anticipated breaking of the seventh seal, his vision lets us see a different kind of sealing. We see the sealing of God's own servants. Instead of seeing the expected end, what we see is the church. The church. For the great day of the wrath has come, and who can withstand it? The church. That's who. Those covered in the blood of the Lamb. The bride of Christ will withstand the wrath because it's already been paid. For them. Anyone who makes the profession that the Apostle Peter made, that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, they become safe within the walls of the holy Catholic Christian Church. Just as Jesus assures us in Matthew 16. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Nothing 
will overcome the church. Brothers and sisters, those first century Christians were about to experience even more trials for being Christ followers. They knew that more intense persecution was on its way. So these early Christians looked for the end. But what came was the church. Not as some substitute for the act, the saving act of God himself, but a dimension of God's saving activity. What seems at first to be a postponement or narrative digression by John turns out to be a skillfully constructed salvation interlude. An interlude that pictures the church during the time of persecution and builds suspense before the final seal is broken. The seventh seal will, in fact, open into another series of seven plagues. But before continuing the woeful pattern of sevens at another level, John gives us a dual vision of the nature and the significance of the Christian community. The holy Catholic Christian church wonderfully diverse and divinely united. What do you believe concerning the Holy Catholic Christian Church? According to our Catechism in Lord's Day 21, question and answer 54, I believe that the Son of God, and of the whole human race, from the beginning of its world to its end, gathers, defends, and preserves for himself by his spirit and word in the unity of true faith, a church. A church chosen to everlasting life. And I believe that I am and forever shall remain a living member of it. That is the vision that we need to keep in front of us at all times, especially dark times. The church is much bigger and greater than we imagine. The church is not only our single congregation. It is an international community numbering hundreds of millions. The 144,000 in John's vision is not a literal number, as some suggest. It represents fullness. It is the complete people of God, 12 times 12 times 1,000. Numbers of fullness. Verse 9, after this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count. From every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes, and they were holding palm branches in their hands. Palm branches that remind us of Palm Sunday, the day where the people cried out, Hosanna, Lord, save us. Well, here in heaven, the people sing a similar song. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. The word salvation in Greek means to be safe, to be salvaged. It carries this connotation of wholeness and healing. It's the New Testament word that expresses the rich meaning of that Old Testament word, shalom. 
Yes, for these earliest Christians and for us Christians today, more persecution is coming. Difficult trials are on the way. But peace will come. Shalom will triumph. It will even come through us, the church. How would the church appear to the eyes of the members of John's churches? Their congregations are very small. Out on the margins of society, politically suspect, without impressive buildings, institutions, or respect from their neighbors. In their minds, it's likely a sharp contrast to the synagogues to which some of them once belonged, with their sense of historical deep roots and worldwide fellowship. The Christians of Asia needed a greater vision of the church to which they belonged. And John's magnificent vision of a beautifully diverse yet profoundly unified community addresses that need. The Holy Spirit still uses this vision for us today as we face all sorts of trials and tribulations. Last week we talked about doing justice and how challenging it can be. This past year, we reflected on the horrors of racism and the evil doctrine of Christian discovery. Residential schools being one horrific example of that doctrine lived out in the hearts and minds of even many in the church. That's why one reason why Revelation 7 offers such a radically counter cultural and much needed vision a corrective vision a vision of what God is doing both in the heavenly and earthly realms the witnesses to that work include a marvelously integrated multitude the message paraphrases verse 9 and following as I saw a huge crowd, too huge to count. Everyone was there, all nations and tribes, all races and languages. Now here's the thing, brothers and sisters. Beautifully diverse, yes, but even more profoundly united. Its members all wear white robes and clutch those palm branches. The whiteness of this multitude's uniform appears to symbolize God's gifts to God's children of both victory and purity. It also, as Walter Taylor points out, signifies its wearer's Status reminds us of the prodigal father who gave his prodigal son a new robe which told everyone that this lost son was now restored to his place in the family. Restored by grace. The palm branches people hold and perhaps wave further emphasize the victory that God has won in Christ on their behalf. There's some other things too that unite the members of this diverse congregation. God has brought each of them through immense suffering and into God's eternal presence. 
The shockingly diverse people who stand in the heavenly realm have by God's grace survived the worst sin Satan and death could do to them. And they have come out on the other side that is the heavenly realm. On earth, this integrated congregation of people that stands before God's throne kept believing. They kept hoping. They kept praying and kept witnessing even when it was incredibly difficult. But now, this shockingly diverse group of saints can finally and fully rest. Shalom at last. They can rest because they're united more than anything by the Lamb who sits on the throne that's right in front of them. Jesus, that Lamb, rescued them not first of all from their misery, but from their rebellion against God and God's good purposes. This Lamb gave them their salvation. Yet these diverse people don't just celebrate what God has already done to rescue them from their sin and misery. They also eagerly anticipate what God yet will do. God will, an elder promises John in this vision, take away all human hunger and thirst. Justice will come. God will no longer let any part of the creation harm or even simply threaten God's adopted sons and daughters. In fact, Revelation 7 ends with the most majestic and stirring of all of its promises. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Perhaps the most tender image in all of Scripture. It's no wonder. It's no wonder that this integrated multitude burst out into two more boisterous songs. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. They jubilantly sing in verse 10. I wonder what that song sounded like could it be like the mighty roar that bursts forth from an enormous crowd when it te its team scores a goal or a touchdown at a sports stadium we often witness a wonderful diversity of people all sharing a common love and goal that their team wins the victory. Brothers and sisters, no matter how much or how little our particular church family demonstrates the diversity of the great big church, it is no less diverse. And we, no matter the color of our skin, our gender, our age, our background, our economic status, we are all united by one thing. And we share a common love and a common person of interest. Jesus Christ. Our faith unites us. Our faith in the person of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The one who is able to break the seals of that scroll and to seal every single one of his redeemed. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp. 
And they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Wow. What a wonderful, wonderful tapestry our God has put together, and we get to be a small part of that. In conclusion, I want to show you this video that gives you a little glimpse of this beautiful scene in Revelation, but not in heaven. The scene is here on this earth. One of the pastors of Tapestry Church is Kyle Brooks, who is a graduate of Calvin Seminary. And as they mentioned in the video, the theme of this church is people of many cultures woven together into the fabric of Oakland to display the beauty of God's story. Be encouraged. I grew up in Oakland, and growing up in Oakland, I noticed that there were a lot of people that were de-churched and unchurched. So I wanted to create a church that would reach those de-churched and unchurched people. And then uh, I met Kyle Brooks, and Kyle and I started talking, and uh, we shared some of the same vision, some of the uh, same goals, some of the same aspirations. Our churches had been in the process of coming together for about a year or so when Charlottesville happened. That day we were on the phone, grieving with each other, trying to make sense of this together, and and Bernard called me and said to me, man, there has got to be a sustained, lived response from the church. This needs needs more than a Facebook post or a Twitter response. This, This needs to change the way we do life as the church. The only way we can live in peace and harmony is it has to be modeled by God's church. So Kyle and I partnered. His church is a predominantly white church. Mine is a predominantly black church. And uh, we partnered together to show the world that we can live in unity. The fact is that we are one. Jesus didn't say try to be one. He said we are one. And we're just trying to act like that. So Tapestry Church is starting not because we thought we had some great idea. Tapestry Church is starting because it's just the natural outflow of the gospel of Jesus, which is to make us one family. At Tapestry, we say that we are people of many cultures woven together into the fabric of Oakland to display the beauty of God's story. So when we say woven together, we mean black woven together, white woven together, Asian woven together, Hispanics woven together. Everybody in the community woven together, involved and active in each other's lives. We are people of many cultures. So we're not just a a white church and a black church coming together. We're a church that that contains people from a wide variety of cultures, a wide variety of backgrounds, a wide variety of age demographics. Basically, if we don't become more and more and more like Jesus, it isn't going to work, which I think is the way the church was always meant to be. I see this church as a church that birth other congregations from it. A church that is moving and in the community and in the city and uh, just woven into the fabric of Oakland. Because we're not just woven together, we're woven together into this city that God loves. The church isn't just about the church. The church is about the world that God loves. And when it comes to the to the work in the community that we want to do, we want simply to equip the people in the church to do the work of the church in the community. So maybe that's you. Maybe you want to gather a group of people around you to, to do something creative that would help our community in Oakland to flourish. We want to support you and equip you in doing that. What you will experience at Tapestry Church is us. Just us. There's no formality. There's no airs. It's just us. So if you're thinking of coming to Tapestry Church, please come 
rest assured, we want and welcome you. Let's go to our God in prayer. Lord God and Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for all the ways that we see this unity in diversity, Lord. We're thankful for this tapestry church and what your Holy Spirit allowed them to do, which encourages us, Lord. Lord, we're encouraged, we're encouraged too when we see the diversity of people at a hockey arena or a sports stadium Lord, all sharing a love for their team and hoping for victory. Lord, this is no different than, than us in the church. We are a group of diverse people with one goal. We love you, Lord Jesus, and we want all others to love you and to know you and to have that beautiful vision of the church, Lord, that is much larger than any single congregation. Lord, we're thankful for this church here, our covenant church. Lord, we might not come from a community that is as diverse as Oakland, but Lord, you can work in our hearts and move in our, in our lives, Lord, to be Christ to this community and all those neighbors that we meet, whatever color of their skin, Lord, whatever economic status or background or age or, or anything, Lord, that uh, is different about us, we can come together with the good news and to share a common faith in Jesus. Lord, Holy Spirit, move us. Move us in the direction you need us to go. Lord, we're thankful for your word. We're thankful that we can proclaim this gospel still freely at this time. Lord, we don't take that for granted. Lord, we're thankful for the members of this church community who continue to go out in this world and use their gifts and use the good news and share that in different ways with their First their families, Lord, but then their neighbors and their co-workers and in this community. Lord, continue to stir us and fill us to be the church, Lord. As, as Kyle mentioned in that video, you didn't call us to be the, be the church. We are the church, Lord, and we are one in Christ. Lord, help us to live that out. We ask it all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Please rise in body or in spirit for our song that is based on this text, Salvation Belongs to Our God. Salvation belongs to our God who sits upon the throne and to the Lamb praise and glory wisdom and thanks honor and power and strength be to our
Before I forget, an idea just came to me, maybe after the church, for those who are, are willing and able, we'll gather on the lawn over here and we're going to spend some time in prayer for Ryan. Our offering and prayer, uh, London Christian High Tuition Assistance, and our church budget ministries. Let's come to our God in prayer. Lord God and Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for education, both public and Christian and private. Lord, it's a wonderful opportunity for our children to learn about your creation. We specifically give thanks for London Christian High who seeks to help the students there to learn about God's creation through a Christian worldview and perspective. And we just pray that that would equip these students to go out into this world, Lord, and to build for your kingdom. So we thank you for this uh, Christian educational institution, and we pray a blessing upon it. We're so thankful, too, for this church, Lord, and that we can do ministry together in so many different ways, freely and openly. And Lord, we give you thanks for that and praise. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. God sends us out with his blessing. May the grace of Christ which daily renews us and the love of God which enables us to love all and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit which unites us in one body make us eager to obey the will of God until we meet again. Through Jesus Christ our Lord and all God's people say, Amen.